This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa. Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S, dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Four Modern Times. Trinco. Book Four, Chapter Three. THE JOURNEY OF DR. Abnubil. After a succession of amazing vicissitudes, the memory of which is in great part lost by the wrongs of time and the bad style of historians, the penguins established the government of the penguins by themselves. They elected a diet or assembly, and invested it with the privilege of naming the head of state. The latter, chosen from among the simple penguins, wore no formidable monster's crest upon his head, and exercised no absolute authority over the people. He was himself subject to the laws of the nation. He was not given the title of king, and no ordinal number followed his name. He bore such names as Patour, Jean Vion, Trafaldin, Coquenhot, and Bredouille. These magistrates did not make war. They were not suited for that. The new state received the name of Public Thing, or Republic. Its partisans were called Republicanists, or Republicans. They were also named Thingmongers, and sometimes Scamps, but this latter name was taken in ill part. The Penguin democracy did not itself govern. It obeyed a financial oligarchy, which formed opinion by means of the newspapers, and held in its hands the representatives, the ministers, and the president. It controlled the finances of the Republic, and directed the foreign affairs of the country as if it were possessed of sovereign power. Empires and kingdoms in those days kept up enormous fleets. Penguinia, compelled to do as they did, sank under the pressure of her armaments. Everybody deplored, or pretended to deplore, so grievous a necessity. However, the rich, and those engaged in business or affairs, submitted to it with a good heart, through a spirit of patriotism and because they counted on the soldiers and sailors to defend their goods at home and to acquire markets and territories abroad. The great manufacturers encouraged the making of cannons and ships through a zeal for the national defense, and in order to obtain orders. Among the citizens of middle rank and of the liberal professions some resigned themselves to this state of affairs without complaining, believing that it would last forever. Others waited impatiently for its end, and thought they might be able to lead the powers to a simultaneous disarmament. The illustrious Professor Abnubil belonged to this latter class. War, said he, is a barbarity to which the progress of civilization will put an end. The great democracies are pacific, and will soon impose their will upon the aristocrats. Professor Abnubil, who had for sixty years led a solitary and retired life in his laboratory, whither external noises did not penetrate, resolved to observe the spirit of the peoples for himself. He began his studies with the greatest of all democracies, and set sail for New Atlantis. After a voyage of fifteen days, his steamer entered, during the night, the harbor of Titanport, where thousands of ships were anchored. An iron bridge thrown across the water and shining with lights stretched between two piers so far apart that Professor Abnubil imagined he was sailing on the seas of Saturn, and that he saw the marvellous ring which girds the planet of the old man, and this immense conduit bore upon it more than a quarter of the wealth of the world. The learned penguin, having disembarked, was waited on by automatons in a hotel forty-eight stories high. Then he took the great railway that led to Gigantopolis, the capital of New Atlantis. In the train there were restaurants, gaming rooms, athletic arenas, telegraphic, commercial, and financial offices, a Protestant church, and the printing office of a great newspaper, which latter the doctor was unable to read, as he did not know the language of the New Atlantans. The train passed along the banks of great rivers, through manufacturing cities which concealed the sky with the smoke from their chimneys, towns black in the day, towns red at night full of noise by day, and full of noise also by night. Here, thought the doctor, is a people far too much engaged in industry and trade to make war. 
I am already certain that the new Atlantans pursue a policy of peace, for it is an axiom admitted by all economists that peace without and peace within are necessary for the progress of commerce and industry. As he surveyed Gigantopolis, he was confirmed in this opinion. People went through the streets so swiftly propelled by hurry that they knocked down all who were in their way. Obnubile was thrown down several times, but soon succeeded in learning how to demean himself better. After an hour's walking, he himself knocked down an Atlantan. Having reached a great square, he saw the portico of a palace in the classic style, whose Corinthian columns reared their capitals of arborescent acanthus seventy meters above the stylobate. As he stood with his head thrown back, admiring the building, a man of modest appearance approached him and said in Penguin, I see by your dress that you are from Penguinia. I know your language. I am a sworn interpreter. This is the Parliament Palace. At the present moment the representatives of the States are in deliberation. Would you like to be present at the sitting? The doctor was brought into the hall, and cast his looks upon the crowd of legislators, who were sitting on cane chairs with their feet upon their desks. The President arose, and in the midst of general inattention, muttered rather than spoke the following formulas, which the interpreter immediately translated to the doctor. A war for the opening of the Mongol markets being ended to the satisfaction of the States, I propose that the accounts be laid before the Finance Committee. Is there any opposition? The proposal is carried. The war for the opening of the markets of Third Zealand being ended to the satisfaction of the States, I propose that the accounts be laid before the Finance Committee. Is there any opposition? The proposal is carried. Have I heard aright? asked Professor Abnubil. What? You, an industrial people, and engaged in all these wars? Certainly, answered the interpreter. These are industrial wars. Peoples who have neither commerce nor industry are not obliged to make war. But a business people is forced to adopt a policy of conquest. The number of wars necessarily increases with our productive activity. As soon as one of our industries fails to find a market for its products, a war is necessary to open new outlets. It is in this way we have had a coal war, a, a copper war, and a cotton war. In Third Zealand we have killed two-thirds of the inhabitants in order to compel the remainder to buy our umbrellas and braces. At that moment a fat man who was sitting in the middle of the assembly ascended the tribune. I claim, said he, a war against the Emerald Republic, which insolently contends with our pigs for the hegemony of hams and sauces in all the markets of the universe. Who is that legislator? asked Dr. Obnubil. He is a pig merchant. Is there any opposition? said the President. I put the proposition to the vote. The war against the Emerald Republic was voted with uplifted hands by a very large majority. What? said Obnubil to the interpreter. You have voted a war with that rapidity and that indifference? Oh, it is an unimportant war which will hardly cost eight million dollars. And men? The men are included in the eight million dollars. Then Dr. Obnubil bent his head in bitter reflection. Since wealth and civilization admit of as many causes of wars as poverty and barbarism, since the folly and wickedness of men are incurable, there remains but one good action to be done. The wise man will collect enough dynamite to blow up this planet. When its fragments fly through space, an imperceptible amelioration will be accomplished in the universe, and a satisfaction will be given to the universal conscience. Moreover, this universal conscience does not exist. End of chapter 3 And the end of book 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa. Michael.Sirwa, S-I-R-O-I-S, dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Five, Modern Times. Chatillon. Book Five, Chapter One. The Reverend Fathers Agaric and Corn Muse. Every system of government produces people who are dissatisfied. 
The Republic, or public thing, produced them at first from among the nobles who had been despoiled of their ancient privileges. These looked with regret and hoped Prince Crucho, the last of the Draconides, a prince adorned both with the grace of youth and the melancholy of exile. It also produced them from among the smaller traders, who, owing to profound economic causes, no longer gained a livelihood. They believed that this was the fault of the Republic, which they had at first adored, and from which each day they were now becoming more detached. The financiers, both Christians and Jews, became by their insolence and their cupidity the scourge of the country, which they plundered and degraded, as well as the scandal of a government which they never troubled either to destroy or preserve. So confident were they that they could operate without hindrance under all governments. Nevertheless, their sympathies inclined to absolute power, as the best protection against the socialists, their puny but ardent adversaries, and just as they imitated the habits of the aristocrats, so they imitated their political and religious sentiments. Their women, in particular, loved the prince, and had dreams of appearing one day at his court. However, the Republic retained some partisans and defenders. If it was not in a position to believe in the fidelity of its own officials, it could at least count on the devotion of the manual laborers, although it had never relieved their misery. These came forth in crowds from the quarries and their factories to defend it, and marched in long processions, gloomy, emaciated, and sinister. They would have died for it because it had given them hope. Now under the presidency of Theodore Formos, there lived in a peaceable suburb of Alca, a monk called Agaric, who kept a school and assisted in arranging marriages. In his school he taught fencing and riding to the sons of old families, illustrious by their birth, but now as destitute of wealth as of privilege. And as soon as they were old enough, he married them to the daughters of the opulent and despised caste of financiers. Tall, thin, and dark, Agaric used to walk in deep thought, with his breviary in his hand and his brow loaded with care, through the corridors of the school and the alleys of the garden. His care was not limited to inculcating in his pupils abstruse doctrines and mechanical precepts, and to endowing them afterwards with legitimate and rich wives. He entertained political designs, and pursued the realization of a gigantic plan. His thought of thoughts and labor of labors was to overthrow the Republic. He was not moved to this by any personal interest. He believed that a democratic state was opposed to the holy society to which body and soul he belonged. And all the other monks, his brethren, thought the same. The Republic was perpetually at strife with the congregation of monks and the assembly of the faithful. True, to plot the death of the new government was a difficult and perilous enterprise. Still, Agaric was in a position to carry on a formidable conspiracy. At that epoch, when the clergy guided the superior classes of the penguins, this monk exercised a tremendous influence over the aristocracy of Alca. All the young men whom he had brought up waited only for a favorable moment to march against the popular power. The sons of the ancient families did not practice the arts or engage in business. They were almost all soldiers and served the Republic. They served it, but they did not love it. They regretted the dragon's crest and the fair Jewesses shared in these regrets in order that they might be taken for Christians. One July, as he was walking in a suburban street which ended in some dusty fields, Agaric heard groans coming from a moss-grown well that had been abandoned by the gardeners, and almost immediately he was told by a cobbler of the neighborhood that a ragged man, who had shouted out, Hurrah for the Republic, had been thrown into the well by some cavalry officers who were passing, and had sunk up to his ears in the mud. Agaric was quite ready to see a general significance in this particular fact. He inferred a great fermentation in the whole aristocratic and military caste, and concluded that it was the moment to act. The next day he went to the end of the Wood of Connells to visit the good father Cornmuse. He found the monk in his laboratory, pouring a golden-colored liquor into a still. He was a short, fat little man, with vermilion-tinted cheeks, and an elaborately polished bald head. His eyes had ruby-colored pupils like a guinea pig's. He graciously saluted his visitor, and offered him a glass of the St. Orborosian liqueur, which he manufactured, and from the sale of which he gained immense wealth. 
Agaric made a gesture of refusal. Then, standing on his long feet and pressing his melancholy hat against his stomach, he remained silent. "'Take a seat,' said Cornmuse to him. Agaric sat down on a rickety stool, but continued mute. Then the monk of Connells inquired, "'Tell me some news of your young pupils. Have the dear children sound views?' "'I am very satisfied with them,' answered the teacher. "'It is everything to be nurtured in sound principles. It is necessary to have sound views before having any views at all, for afterwards it is too late. Yes, I have great grounds for comfort, but we live in a sad age.' Alas, sighed Cornmuse, we are passing through evil days. Times of trial. Yet, Cornmuse, the mind of the public is not so entirely corrupted as it seems. Perhaps you are right. The people are tired of a government that ruins them and does nothing for them. Every day fresh scandals spring up. The republic is sunk in shame. It is ruined. May God grant it. Cornmuse, what do you think of Prince Crucho? He is an amiable young man, and, I dare say, a, a worthy scion of an august stock. I pity him for having to endure the pains of exile at so early an age. Spring has no flowers for the exile, and autumn no fruits. Prince Crucho has sound views. He respects the clergy, he practices our religion. Besides, he consumes a good deal of my little products. Cornmuse, in many homes, both rich and poor, his return is hoped for. Believe me, he will come back. May I live to throw my mantle beneath his feet, sighed Cornmuse. Seeing that he held these sentiments, Agaric depicted to him the state of people's minds such as he himself imagined them. He showed him the nobles and the rich exasperated against the popular government, the army refusing to endure fresh insults the officials willing to portray their chiefs, the people discontented, riot ready to burst forth, and the enemies of the monks, the agents of the constituted authority, thrown into the wells of Alca. He concluded that it was the moment to strike a great blow. We can, he cried, save the penguin people. We can deliver it from its tyrants, deliver it from itself, restore the dragon's crest, re-establish the ancient state, the good state for the honor of the faith and the exaltation of the church. We can do this if we will. We possess great wealth, and we exert secret influences. By our evangelistic and outspoken journals we communicate with all the ecclesiastics in towns and county alike, and we inspire them with our own eager enthusiasm and our own burning faith. They will kindle their penitents in their congregations. I can dispose of the chiefs of the army, I have an understanding with the men of the people. Unknown to them, I sway the minds of umbrella sellers, publicans, uh, shopmen, uh, gutter merchants, newspaper boys, women of the streets, and police agents. We have more people on our side than we need. What are we waiting for? Let us act. What do you think of doing? asked Cornmuse. Of forming a vast conspiracy and overthrowing the Republic of re-establishing Crucho on the throne of the Draconides. Cornmuse moistened his lips with his tongue several times. Then he said with unction, Certainly the restoration of the Draconides is desirable. It is eminently desirable, and for my part desire it with all my heart. As for the Republic, you know what I think of it. But would it not be better to abandon it to its fate and let it die of the vices of its own constitution? Doubtless, Agaric, what you propose is noble and generous. It would be a fine thing to save this great and unhappy country, to re-establish it in its ancient splendor. But reflect on it. We are Christians before we are penguins, and we must take heed not to compromise religion in political enterprises. Agaric replied eagerly, Fear nothing. We shall hold all the threads of the plot, but we ourselves shall remain in the background. We shall not be seen. Like flies and milk, murmured the monk of Connells, and turning his keen ruby-colored eyes towards his brother monk, take care. Perhaps the Republic is stronger than it seems, possibly, too, by dragging it out of the nerveless inertia in which it now rests, we may only consolidate its forces. 
Its malice is great. If we attack it, it will defend itself. It makes bad laws which hardly affect us. If it is frightened, it will make terrible ones against us. Let us not lightly engage in an adventure in which we may get fleeced. You think the opportunity a good one. I don't, and I am going to tell you why. The present government is not yet known by everybody. That is to say, it is known by nobody. It proclaims that it is the public thing, the common thing. The populace believes it, and remains democratic and republican. But patience! This same people will one day demand that the public thing be the people's thing. I need not tell you how insolent, unregulated, and contrary to scriptural polity such claims seem to me. But the people will make them, and enforce them, and then there will be an end of the present government. The moment cannot now be far distant, and it is then that we ought to act in the interests of our august body. Let us wait. What hurries us? Our existence is not in peril. It has not been rendered absolutely intolerable to us. The Republic fails in respect and submission to us. It does not give the priests the honours it owes them, but it lets us live. And such is the excellence of our position that with us to live is to prosper. The Republic is hostile to us, but women revere us. President Foremost does not assist at the celebration of our mysteries, but I have seen his wife and daughters at my feet. They buy my files by the gross. I have no better clients even among the aristocracy. Let us say what there is to be said for it. There is no country in the world as good for priests and monks as Pinguinia. In what other country would you find our virgin wax, our virile incense, our rosaries, our scapulars, our holy water, and our St. Orborosian liqueur sold in such great quantities? What other people would, like the penguins, give a hundred golden crowns for a wave of our hands, a sound from our mouths, a movement of our lips? For my part, I gain a thousand times more in this pleasant, faithful, and docile penguinia by extracting the essence from a bundle of time than I could make by tiring my lungs with preaching the remission of sins in the most populous states of Europe and America. Honestly, would Pinguinia be better off if a police officer came to take me away from here and put me on a steamboat bound for the islands of night? Having thus spoken, the monk of Connells got up and led his guest into a huge shed where hundreds of orphans, clothed in blue, were packing bottles, nailing up cases, and gumming tickets. The ear was deafened by the noise of hammers mingled with the dull rumbling of veils being placed upon the rails. "'It is from here that consignments are forwarded,' said Cornmuse. "'I have obtained from the government a railway through the wood and a station at my door. Every three days I fill a truck with my own products. You see that the Republic has not killed all beliefs.' Agaric made a last effort to engage the wise distiller in his enterprise. He pointed him to a prompt, certain, dazzling success. "'Don't you wish to share in it?' he added. Don't you wish to bring back your king from exile? Exile is pleasant to men of good will, answered the monk of Connells. If you are guided by me, my dear brother Agaric, you will give up your project for the present. For my own part, I have no illusions whether or not I belong to your party. If you lose, I shall have to pay like you. Father Agaric took leave of his friend and went back satisfied to his school. Cornmuse, thought he, not being able to prevent the plot, would like to make it succeed, and he will give money. Agaric was not deceived. Such indeed was the solidarity among priests and monks, that the acts of a single one bound them all. That was at once both their strength and their weakness. End of Book 5, Chapter 1「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa, Michael.Sirwa, S-I-R-O-I-S dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book 5, Modern Times, Châtillon. Book 5, Chapter 2, Prince Crucho. 
Agaric resolved to proceed without delay to Prince Crucho, who honoured him with his familiarity. In the dusk of the evening he went out of his school by the side door, disguised as a cattle merchant, and took passage on board the St. Mail. The next day he landed in Porpoisia, for it was at Chitterling's castle on this hospitable soil that Crucho ate the bitter bread of exile. Agaric met the prince on the road, driving in a motor-car with two young ladies, at the rate of a hundred miles an hour. When the monk saw him he shook his red umbrella, and the prince stopped his car. "'Is it you, Agaric? Get in! There are already three of us, but we can make room for you. You can take one of these young ladies on your knee.' The pious Agaric got in. "'What news, worthy father?' asked the young prince. "'Great news,' answered Agaric. "'Can I speak?' Well, you can. I have nothing secret from these two ladies. <laughs> Sire, Penguinia claims you. You will not be deaf to her call. Agaric described the state of feeling and outlined a vast plot. On my first signal, said he, all your partisans will rise at once. With cross in hand and habits girded up, your venerable clergy will lead the armed crowd into Formosa's palace. We shall carry terror and death among your enemies. For a reward of our efforts, we only ask of you, sire, that you will not render them useless. We entreat you to come and seat yourself on the throne that we shall prepare. The prince returned a simple answer. I shall enter Alka on a green horse. Agaric declared that he accepted this manly response. Although contrary to his custom, he had a lady on his knee. He adjured the young prince, with a sublime loftiness of soul, to be faithful to his royal duties. Sire, he cried, with tears in his eyes, you will live to remember the day on which you have been restored from exile, given back to your people, re-established on the throne of your ancestors by the hands of your monks, and crowned by them with the august crest of the dragon. King Crucho, may you equal the glory of your ancestor Draco the Great. The young prince threw himself with emotion on his restorer, and attempted to embrace him but he was prevented from reaching him by the girth of the two ladies, so tightly packed were they all in that historic carriage. "'Worthy father,' said he, "'I would like all Penguinia to witness this embrace.' "'It would be a cheering spectacle,' said Agaric. In the meantime the motor-car rushed like a tornado through hamlets and villages, crushing hens, geese, turkeys, ducks, guinea-fowls, cats, dogs, pigs, children, laborers, and women beneath its insatiable tires. And the pious Agaric turned over his great designs in his mind. His voice, coming from behind one of the ladies, expressed this thought. We must have money, a great deal of money. That is your business, answered the prince. But already the park gates were opening to the formidable motor-car. The dinner was sumptuous. They toasted the dragon's crest. Everybody knows that a closed goblet is a sign of sovereignty, so Prince Crucho and Princess Gudrun, his wife, drank out of goblets that were covered over like ciboriums. The prince had his filled several times with the wines of Penguinia, both white and red. Crucho had received a truly princely education, and he excelled in motoring, but he was not ignorant of history either. He was said to be well versed in antiquities and famous deeds of his family and indeed he gave a notable proof of his knowledge in this respect. As they were speaking of the various remarkable peculiarities that had been noticed in famous women, It is perfectly true, said he, that Queen Crucha, whose name I bear, had the mark of a little monkey's head upon her body. <laughs> During the evening Agaric had a decisive interview with three of the prince's oldest counsellors. It was decided to ask for funds from Crucho's father-in-law, as he was anxious to have a king for son-in-law, from several Jewish ladies, who were impatient to become ennobled, and finally from the Prince Regent of the Porpoises, who had promised his aid to the Draconides, thinking that by Crucho's restoration he would weaken the penguins, the hereditary enemies of his people. The three old councillors divided among themselves the three chief offices of the court, those of Chamberlain, Seneschal, and High Steward, and authorized the monk to distribute the other places to the Prince's best advantage. Devotion has to be rewarded, said the three old counsellors. And treachery also, said Agaric. It is but too true, replied one of them, the Marquis of Seven Wounds, who had experience of revolutions. 
There was dancing, and after the ball Princess Gudrun tore up her green robe to make cockades. With her own hands she sewed a piece of it on the monk's breast, upon which he shed tears of sensibility and gratitude. M. de Plume, the prince's equerry, set out the same evening to look for a green horse. End of Book 5, Chapter 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa. Michael.Sirwa, S-I-R-O-I-S, dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Five, Modern Times, Chatillon. Book Five, Chapter Three, The Cabal. After his return to the capital of Pinguinia, the Reverend Father Agaric disclosed his projects to Prince Adelestan de Boseno, of whose draconian sentiments he was well aware. The prince belonged to the highest nobility. The Torticol de Boseno went back to Brian the Good, and under the Draconides had held the highest offices in the kingdom. In 1179, Philip Torticol, High Admiral of Penguinia, a brave, faithful, and generous, but vindictive man, delivered over the port of La Crique and the Penguin fleet to the enemies of the kingdom, because he suspected that Queen Crucha, whose lover he was, had been unfaithful to him and loved a stable boy. It was that great queen who gave to the Bosenos the silver warming pan which they bear in their arms. As for their motto, it only goes back to the sixteenth century. The story of its origin is as follows. One gala night, as he mingled with a crowd of courtiers who were watching the fireworks in the king's garden, Duke John de Boseno approached the Duchess of Skull and put his hand under the petticoat of that lady, who made no complaint at the gesture. The king, happening to pass, surprised them, and contented himself with saying, And thus I find you. These four words became the motto of the Bosenos. Prince Adelestan had not degenerated from his ancestors. He preserved an unalterable fidelity for the race of the Draconides, and desired nothing so much as the restoration of Prince Crucho, an event which was in his eyes to be the forerunner of the restoration of his own fortune. He therefore readily entered into the Reverend Father Agaric's plans. He joined himself at once to the monk's projects, and hastened to put him into communication with the most loyal royalists of his acquaintance, Count Clena, Monsieur de la Tromel, Viscount Olive, and Monsieur Vigor. They met together one night in the Duke of Ampoule's country house, six miles eastward of Alca, to consider ways and means. Monsieur de la Tromel was in favor of legal action. We ought to keep within the law, said he in substance. We are for order. It is by an untiring propaganda that we shall best pursue the realization of our hopes. We must change the feeling of the country. Our cause will conquer because it is just. The Prince de Boseno expressed a contrary opinion. He thought that in order to triumph, just causes need force quite as much and even more than unjust causes require it. In the present situation, said he tranquilly three methods of action present themselves to hire the butcher boys to corrupt the ministers and to kidnap president formos it would be a mistake to kidnap formos objected m de la tromel the president is on our side the attitude and sentiments of the president of the republic are explained by the fact that one dracophile proposed to seize formos while another dracophile regarded him as a friend Formos showed himself favorable to the royalists, whose habits he admired and imitated. If he smiled at the mention of the dragon's crest, it was at the thought of putting it on his own head. He was envious of sovereign power, not because he felt himself capable of exercising it, but because he loved to appear so. According to the expression of a penguin chronicler, he was a goose. Prince de Bosenos maintained his proposal to march against Formos's palace and the House of Parliament. Count Clena was even still more energetic. Let us begin, said he, by slaughtering, disempowelling, and braining the Republicans, and all partisans of the government. Afterwards we shall see what more need be done. Monsieur de la Tromel was a moderate, and moderates are always moderately opposed to violence. He recognized that Count Clena's policy was inspired by a noble feeling, and that it was high-minded. 
but he timidly objected that perhaps it was not conformable to principle, and that it presented certain dangers. At last he consented to discuss it. "'I propose,' added he, "'to draw up an appeal to the people. Let us show who we are. For my own part I can assure you that I shall not hide my flag in my pocket.' M. Bigor began to speak. Gentlemen, the penguins are dissatisfied with the new order because it exists, and it is natural for men to complain of their condition. But at the same time, the penguins are afraid to change their government because new things alarm them. They have not known the dragon's crest, and although they sometimes say that they regret it, we must not believe them. It is easy to see that they speak in this way, either without thought or because they are in ill temper. Let us not have any illusions about their feelings towards ourselves. They do not like us. They hate the aristocracy, both from a base envy and from a generous love of equality. And these two united feelings are very strong in a people. Public opinion is not against us, because it knows nothing about us. But when it knows what we want, it will not follow us. If we let it be seen that we wish to destroy democratic government and restore the dragon's crest, who will be our partisans? Only the butcher boys and the little shopkeepers of Alca. And could we even count on them to the end? They are dissatisfied. But at the bottom of their hearts they are republicans. They are more anxious to sell their cursed wares than to see Crucho again. If we act openly, we shall only cause alarm. To make people sympathize with us and follow us, we must make them believe that we want not to overthrow the Republic, but on the contrary, to restore it, to cleanse, to purify, to embellish, to adorn, to beautify, and to ornament it, to render it, in a word, glorious and attractive. Therefore we ought not to act openly ourselves. It is known that we are not favorable to the present order. We must have recourse to a friend of the Republic, and if we are to do what is best to a defender of this government, we have plenty to choose from. It would be well to prefer the most popular, and if I dare say so, the most Republican of them. We shall win him over to us by flattery, by presents, and above all by promises. Promises cost less than presents, and are worth more. No one gives as much as he who gives hopes. It is not necessary for the man we choose to be of brilliant intellect. I would even prefer him to be of no great ability. Stupid people show an inimitable grace in roguery. Be guided by me, gentlemen and overthrow the Republic by the agency of a Republican. Let us be prudent, but prudence does not exclude energy. If you need me, you will find me at your disposal. This speech made a great impression upon those who heard it. The mind of the pious Agaric was particularly impressed, but each of them was anxious to appoint himself to a position of honor and profit. A secret government was organized, of which all those present were elected active members. The Duke of Ampule, who was the great financier of the party, was chosen treasurer and charged with organizing funds for the propaganda. The meeting was on the point of coming to an end when a rough voice was heard singing an old air. Boseno et un gros cochon, on en va faire des andouris, des et du jambon. It had for two hundred years been a well-known song in the slums of Alca. Prince Boseno did not like to hear it. He went down into the street, and perceiving that the singer was a workman who was placing some slates on the roof of a church, he politely asked him to sing something else. "'I will sing what I like,' answered the man. "'My friend, to please me. I don't want to please you.' Prince Boseno was as a rule good-tempered, but he was easily angered and a man of great strength. "'Fellow, come down, or I will go up to you,' cried he in a terrible voice. As the workman, astride on his coping, showed no sign of budging, the prince climbed quickly up the staircase of the tower and attacked the singer. 
He gave him a blow that broke his jawbone and sent him rolling into a water spout. At that moment seven or eight carpenters who were working on the rafters heard their companions cry and looked through the window. Seeing the prince on the coping, they climbed along a ladder that was leaning on the slates and reached him just as he was slipping into the tower. They sent him head foremost down the one hundred and thirty-seven steps of the spiral staircase. End of Book 5, Chapter 3「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa, Michael.Sirwa, S-I-R-O-I-S, dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book 5. Modern Times. Chatillon. Book 5. Chapter 4 by Countess Olive. The penguins had the finest army in the world. So had the porpoises. And it was the same with the other nations of Europe. The smallest amount of thought will prevent any surprise at this, for all armies are the finest in the world. The second finest army, if one could exist, would be in a notoriously inferior position. It would be certain to be beaten. It ought to be disbanded at once. Therefore, all armies are the finest in the world. In France, the illustrious Colonel Marchand understood this when, before the passage of the Yalu, being questioned by some journalists about the Russo-Japanese War, he did not hesitate to describe the Russian army as the finest in the world, and also the Japanese. And it should be noticed that even after suffering the most terrible reverses, an army does not fall from its position of being the finest in the world. For if nations ascribe their victories to the ability of their generals and the courage of their soldiers, they always attribute their defeats to an inexplicable fatality. On the other hand, navies are classed according to the number of their ships. There is a first, a second, a third, and so on, so that there exists no doubt as to the result of naval wars. The Penguins had the finest army and the second navy in the world. This navy was commanded by the famous Châtillon, who bore the title of Emeril Bar, and by abbreviation Emeril. It is the same word which, unfortunately in a corrupt form, is used today among several European nations to designate the highest grade in the naval service. But as there was but one Emeril among the Penguins, a singular prestige, if I dare say so, was attached to that rank. The Emeril did not belong to the nobility. A child of the people, he was loved by the people. They were flattered to see a man who sprang from their own ranks, holding a position of honor. Chatillon was good-looking, and fortune favored him. He was not over-addicted to thought. No event ever disturbed his serene outlook. The Reverend Father Agaric, surrendering to M. Bigor's reasons, and recognizing that the existing government could only be destroyed by one of its defenders, cast his eyes upon Emeril Chatillon. He asked a large sum of money from his friend, the Reverend Father Cornmuse, which the latter handed him with a sigh, and with this sum he hired six hundred butcher boys of Alca to run behind Chatillon's horse and shout, Hurrah for the Emeril! Henceforth Chatillon could not take a single step without being cheered. Viscountess Olive asked him for a private interview. He received her at the Admiralty, or better, Emeralty, in a room decorated with anchors, shells, and grenades. She was discreetly dressed in grayish blue. A hat trimmed with roses covered her pretty fair hair. Behind her veil her eyes shone like sapphires. Although she came of Jewish origin, there was no more fashionable woman in the whole nobility. She was tall and well-shaped. Her form was that of the year her figure that of the season. Emeral, said she, in a delightful voice, I cannot conceal my emotion from you. It is very natural, before a hero. You are too kind. But tell me, Viscountess, what brings me the honour of your visit? For a long time I have been anxious to see you, to speak to you, so I very willingly undertook to convey a message to you. Please take a seat. How still it is here. Uh, yes, it is quiet enough. You can hear the birds singing. Sit down then, dear lady. And he drew up an armchair for her. She took a seat with her back to the light. Emeril, 
I came to bring you a very important message. A message... Explain. Emeril, have you ever seen Prince Crucho? Never. She sighed. It is a great pity. He would be so delighted to see you. He esteems and appreciates you. He has your portrait on his desk beside his mother's. What a pity it is he is not better known. He is a charming prince, and so grateful for what is done for him. He will be a great king, for he will be king without doubt. He will come back, and sooner than people think. What I have to tell you, the message with which I am entrusted, refers precisely to the... The emerald stood up. Not a word more, dear lady. I have the esteem the confidence of the Republic. I will not betray it. And why should I betray it? I am loaded with honours and dignities. Allow me to tell you, my dear Emeril, that your honours and dignities are far from equaling what you deserve. If your services were properly rewarded, you would be Emeralissimo and Generalissimo, commander-in-chief of the troops both on the land and sea, the Republic is very ungrateful to you. All governments are more or less ungrateful. Yes, but the Republicans are jealous of you. That class of person is always afraid of his superiors. They cannot endure the services. Everything that has to do with the Navy and the Army is odious to them. They are afraid of you. That is possible. They are wretches. They are ruining the country. Don't you wish to save Penguinia? In what way? By sweeping away all the rascals of the Republic, all the Republicans. What a proposal to make to me, dear lady. It is what will certainly be done, if not by you, then by someone else. The Generalissimo, to mention him alone, is ready to throw all the ministers, deputies, and senators into the sea, and to recall Prince Crucho. Oh! The rascal, the scoundrel, exclaimed the emeril. Do to him what he would do to you. The prince will know how to recognize your services. He will give you the constable's sword and a, a magnificent grant. I am commissioned, in the meantime, to hand you a pledge of his royal friendship. As she said these words, she drew a green cockade from her bosom. What is that? asked the emeril. It is his colors which Crucho sends you. Be good enough to take them back. So that they may be offered to the Generalissimo, who will accept them? No, Emeril, let me place them on your glorious breast. Chatillon gently repelled the lady, but for some minutes he thought her extremely pretty, and he felt this impression still more when two bare arms and the rosy palms of two delicate hands touched him lightly. He yielded almost immediately. Olive was slow in fastening the ribbon. Then when it was done she made a low courtesy and saluted Chatillon with the title of constable. "'I have been ambitious like my comrades,' answered the sailor. "'I don't hide it, and perhaps I am so still. But upon my word of honour when I look at you, the only desire I feel is for a cottage and a heart.' She turned upon him the charming sapphire glances that flashed from under her eyelids. That is to be had also. <gasps> what are you doing, Emeril? I am looking for the heart. When she left the Admiralty, the Viscountess went immediately to the Reverend Father Agaric to give an account of her visit. You must go to him again, dear lady, said that austere monk. End of Book Five, Chapter Four This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa, Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Five Modern Times. Chatillon. Book Five, Chapter Five. The Prince de Bosseno. Morning and evening, the newspapers that had been bought by the Dracophiles proclaimed Chatillon's praises and hurled shame and opprobrium upon the ministers of the Republic. Chatillon's portrait was sold through the streets of Alca. 
Those young descendants of Remus who carry plaster figures on their heads offered busts of Chatillon for sale upon the bridges. Every evening Chatillon rode upon his white horse round the Queen's Meadow, a place frequented by the people of fashion. The Dracophiles posted along the Emerald's route, a crowd of needy penguins who kept shouting, It is Chatillon we want! Chatillon! It is Chatillon we want! The middle classes of Alca conceived a profound admiration for the Emerald. Shopwomen murmured, He is good-looking. Women of fashion slackened the pace of their motor-cars and kissed hands to him as they passed, amid the hurrahs of an enthusiastic populace. One day, as he went into a tobacco shop, two penguins, who were putting letters in the box, recognized Chatillon and cried at the top of their voices, Hurrah for the Emerald! Down with the Republicans! All those who were passing stopped in front of the shop. Chatillon lighted his cigar before the eyes of a dense crowd of frenzied citizens who waved their hats and cheered. The crowd kept increasing, and the whole town, singing and marching behind its hero, went back with him to the Admiralty. The Emeril had an old comrade in arms, under Emeril Vulcanmold, who had served with great distinction, a man as true as gold and as loyal as his sword. Vulcanmold plumed himself on his thoroughgoing independence, and he went along the partisans of Crucho and the minister of the Republic telling both parties what he thought of them. M. Bigor maliciously declared that he told each party what the other party thought of it. In truth, he had on several occasions been guilty of regrettable indiscretions, which were overlooked as being the freedoms of a soldier who knew nothing of intrigue. Every morning he went to see Chatillon, whom he treated with the cordial roughness of a brother-in-arms. "'Well, old buffer, so you are popular,' said he to him. Ah, "'Your fizz is sold on the heads of pipes and on liqueur bottles, and every drunkard in Alka spits out your name as he rolls in the gutter. <laughs> Chatillon, the hero of the penguins! Chatillon, defender of the penguin glory! Who would have said it? Who would have thought it?' <laughs> and he laughed with his harsh laugh, then changing his tone, but— Joking aside, uh, are you not a bit surprised at what is happening to you? No, indeed, answered Chatillon. And out went the honest Vulcanmold, banging the door behind him. In the meantime, Chatillon had taken a little flat at number 18 Johannes Talpa Street, so that he might receive Viscountess Olive. They met there every day. He was desperately in love with her. During his martial and Neptunian life he had loved crowds of women, red, black, yellow, and white, and some of them had been very beautiful, but before he met the Viscountess he did not know what a woman really was. When the Viscountess Olive called him her darling, her dear darling, he felt in heaven, and it seemed to him that the stars shone in her hair. She would come a little late, and as she put her bag on the table she would ask pensively, Let me sit on your knee. And then she would talk of subjects suggested by the pious Agaric, interrupting the conversation with sighs and kisses. She would ask him to dismiss such and such an officer, to give a command to another, or send the squadron here or there, and at the right moment she would exclaim, How young you are, my dear! And he did whatever she wished, for he was simple. He was anxious to wear the constable's sword, and to receive a large grant. He did not dislike playing a double part. He had a vague idea of saving Penguinia, and he was in love. This delightful woman induced him to remove the troops that were at La Cirque, the port where Crucho was to land. By this means it was made certain that there would be no obstacle to prevent the prince from entering Penguinia. The pious Agaric organized public meetings so as to keep up the agitation. The Dracophiles held one or two every day in some of the thirty-six districts of Alca, and preferably in the poorer quarters. They desired to win over the poor, for they are the most numerous. On the 4th of May, a particularly fine meeting was held in an old cattle market, situated in the centre of a populous suburb filled with housewives sitting on the doorsteps and children playing in the gutters. There were present about two thousand people, in the opinion of the Republicans, and six thousand according to the reckoning of the Dracophiles. In the audience was to be seen the flower of Penguin society, including Prince and Princess de Bosseno, Count Clena, Monsieur de la Tromel, Monsieur Bigor, and several rich Jewish ladies. The Generalissimo of the National Army had come in uniform. He was cheered. The committee had been carefully formed. A man of the people, a workman, 
but a man of sound principles, M. Rochin, the secretary of the Yellow Syndicate, was asked to preside, supported by Count Clena and M. Michaud, a butcher. The government which Penguinia had freely given itself was called by such names as cesspool and drain in several eloquent speeches, but President Formos was spared, and no mention was made of Crucho or the priests. The meeting was not unanimous. A defender of the modern state and of the Republic, a manual laborer, stood up. Gentlemen, said M. Rochin, the chairman, we have told you that this meeting would not be unanimous. We are not like our opponents. We are honest men. I allow our opponent to speak. Heaven knows what you are going to hear, gentlemen. I beg of you to restrain as long as you can the expression of your contempt, your disgust, and your indignation. Gentlemen, said the opponent. Immediately he was knocked down, trampled beneath the feet of the indignant crowd, and his unrecognizable remains thrown out of the hall. The tumult was still resounding when Count Clena ascended the tribune. Cheers took the place of groans, and when silence was restored, the orator uttered these words, Comrades, we are going to see whether you have blood in your veins. What we have got to do is to slaughter, disembowel, and brain all the Republicans. This speech let loose such a thunder of applause that the old shed rocked with it, and a cloud of acrid and thick dust fell from its filthy walls and worm-eaten beams and enveloped the audience. A resolution was carried vilifying the government and acclaiming Chatillon, and the audience departed singing the hymn of the Liberator. It is Chatillon we want. The only way out of the old market was through a muddy alley, shut in by omnibus stables and coal sheds. There was no moon, and a cold drizzle was coming down. The police, who were assembled in great numbers, blocked the alley, and compelled the dracophiles to disperse in little groups. These were the instructions they had received from their chief, who was anxious to check the enthusiasm of the excited crowd. The dracophiles who were detained in the alley kept marking time and singing, It is shot young beyond. Soon, becoming impatient of the delay, the cause of which they did not know, they began to push those in front of them. This movement propagated along the alley through those in front against the broad chests of the police. The latter had no hatred for the dracophiles. In the bottom of their hearts they liked Chatillon. But it is natural to resist aggression, and strong men are inclined to make use of their strength. For these reasons the police kicked the dracophiles with their hobnailed boots. As a result there were sudden rushes backwards and forwards. Threats and cries mingled with the songs. Murder! Murder! It is murder! Murder! It is murder! Murder! And in the gloomy alley the more prudent kept saying, Don't push! Don't push! Among these latter, in the darkness, his lofty figure rising above the moving crowd, his broad shoulders and robust body noticeable among the trampled limbs and crushed sides of the rest, stood the Prince de Boseno, calm, immovable, and placid. Serenely and indulgently he waited. In the meantime, as the exit was opened at regular intervals between the ranks of the police, the pressure of elbows against the chests of those around the Prince diminished, and people began to breathe again. "'You see, we shall soon be able to go out,' said that kindly giant, with a pleasant smile. "'Time and patience.' He took a cigar from his case raised it to his lips and struck a match. Suddenly, in the light of the match, he saw Princess Anne, his wife, clasped in Count Clena's arms. At this sight he rushed towards them, striking both them and those around with his cane. He was disarmed, though not without difficulty, but he could not be separated from his opponent, and whilst the fainting princess was lifted from arm to arm to her carriage over the excited and curious crowd, the two men still fought furiously. Prince de Boseno lost his hat, his eyeglass, his cigar, his necktie, and his portfolio full of private letters and political correspondence. He even lost the miraculous medals that he had received from the good father Cornmuse. But he gave his opponent so terrible a kick in the stomach that the unfortunate count was knocked through an iron grating and went head foremost through a glass door and into a coal shed. Attracted by the struggle and the cries of those around, the police rushed towards the prince, who furiously resisted them. He stretched three of them gasping at his feet and put seven others to flight, with respectively a broken jaw, a split lip, a nose pouring blood, 
a fractured skull, a torn ear, a dislocated collarbone, and broken ribs. He fell, however, and was dragged, bleeding and disfigured, with his clothes in rags, to the nearest police station, where, jumping about and bellowing, he spent the night. At daybreak, groups of demonstrators went about the town singing, It is Chatillon we want, and breaking the windows of the houses in which the ministers of the Republic lived. End of Book 5, Chapter 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa, Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Five Modern Times, Chatillon. Book Five, Chapter Six The Emerald's Fall. That night marked the culmination of the Dracophile movement. The royalists had no longer any doubt of its triumph. Their chiefs sent congratulations to Prince Crucho by wireless telegraphy. Their ladies embroidered scarves and slippers for him. Monsieur de Plume had found the green horse. The pious Agaric shared the common hope, but he still worked to win the partisans for the pretender. They ought, he said, to lay their foundations upon the bedrock. With this design he had an interview with three trade-union workmen. In these times the artisans no longer lived, as in the days of the Draconides, under the government of corporations. They were free, but they had no assured pay. After having remained isolated from each other for a long time, without help and without support, they had formed themselves into unions. The coffers of the unions were empty, as it was not the habit of the unionists to pay their subscriptions. There were unions numbering thirty thousand members, others with a thousand, five hundred, two hundred, and so forth. Several numbered two or three members only, or even a few less. But as the lists of adherents were not published, it was not easy to distinguish the great unions from the small ones. After some dark and indirect steps, the pious Agaric was put into communication, in a room in the Moulin de Galette, with comrades Dagobert, Tronc, and Balafil, the secretaries of three unions, of which the first numbered fourteen members, the second twenty-four, and the third only one. Agaric showed extreme cleverness at this interview. Gentlemen, said he, you and I have not, in most respects, the same political and social views, but there are points in which we may come to an understanding. We have a common enemy. The government exploits you and despises us. Help us to overthrow it. We will supply you with the means so far as we are able, and you can, in addition, count on our gratitude. Fork out the tin, said Dagobert. The reverend father placed on the table a bag which the distiller of Connells had given him with tears in his eyes. Done, Done, said the three companions. Thus was the solemn compact sealed. As soon as the monk had departed, carrying with him the joy of having won over the masses to his cause, Dagobert, Tronc, and Balafil whistled to their wives, Amelia, Queenie, and Matilda, who were waiting in the street for the signal, and all six, holding each other's hands, danced around the bag, singing, And they ordered a salad bowl full of warm wine. In the evening all six went through the street from stall to stall singing their new song. The song became popular, for the detectives reported that every day showed an increase of the number of workpeople who sang through the slums, The Dracophile agitation made no progress in the provinces. The pious Agaric sought to find the cause of this, but was unable to discover it until old Cornmuse revealed it to him. "'I have proofs,' sighed the monk of Connells, "'that the Duke of Ampchul, the treasurer of the Dracophiles, has bought property in Porporzia with the funds that he received for the propaganda.' The party wanted money. Prince de Boseno had lost his portfolio in a brawl and he was reduced to painful expedients which were repugnant to his impetuous character. The Viscountess Olive was expensive. Cornmuse advised that the monthly allowance of that lady should be diminished. She is very useful to us, objected the pious Agaric. Undoubtedly, answered Cornmuse, 
but she does us an injury by ruining us. A schism divided the Dracophiles. Misunderstandings reigned in their councils. Some wished that in accordance with the policy of M. Bigor and the pious Agaric, they should carry on the design of reforming the public. Others, wearied by their long constraint, had resolved to proclaim the dragon's crest and swore to conquer beneath that sign. The latter encouraged the advantage of a clear situation and the impossibility of making a pretense much longer, and in truth the public began to see whither the agitation was tending, and that the Emerald's partisans wanted to destroy the very foundations of the Republic. A report was spread that the prince was to land at La Cirque and make his entry into Alca on a green horse. These rumors excited the fanatical monks, delighted the poor nobles, satisfied the rich Jewish ladies, and put hope in the hearts of the small traders. But very few of them were inclined to purchase these benefits at the price of a social catastrophe and the overthrow of the public credit, and there were fewer still who would have risked their money, their peace, their liberty, or a single hour from their pleasures in the business. On the other hand, the workmen held themselves ready as ever to give a day's work to the Republic and a strong resistance was being formed in the suburbs. The people are with us, the pious Agaric used to say. However, men, women, and children, when leaving their factories, used to shout with one voice, Abba Chatillon, hou hou la calotte. As for the government, it showed the weakness, indecision, flabbiness, and heedlessness common to all governments, and from which none has ever departed without falling into arbitrariness and violence. In three words, it knew nothing, wanted nothing, and would do nothing. Formos, shut in his presidential palace, remained blind, dumb, deaf, huge, invisible, wrapped up in his pride as in an eiderdown. Count Olive advised the Dracophiles to make a last appeal for funds and to attempt a great stroke while Alca was still in a ferment. An executive committee, which he himself had chosen, decided to kidnap the members of the Chamber of Deputies and considered ways and means. The affair was fixed for the 28th of July. On that day the sun rose radiantly over the city. In front of the legislative palace women passed to market with their baskets, hawkers cried their peaches, pears, and grapes, cab horses with their noses in their bags munched their hay. Nobody expected anything, not because the secret had been kept, but because it met with nothing but unbelievers. Nobody believed in a revolution and from this fact we may conclude that nobody desired one. About two o'clock, the deputies began to pass, few and unnoticed, through the side door of the palace. At three o'clock, a few groups of badly dressed men had formed. At half-past three, black masses coming from the adjacent streets spread over Revolution Square. This vast expanse was soon covered by an ocean of soft hats, and the crowd of demonstrators continually increased by sightseers having crossed the bridge, struck its dark wave against the walls of the legislative enclosure. Cries, murmurs, and songs went up to the impassive sky. Down with the deputies. Down with the Republicans. Death to the Republicans. The devoted band of Dracophiles, led by Prince de Boseno, struck up the august canticle. Behind the wall, silence alone replied. The silence and the absence of guards encouraged and at the same time frightened the crowd. Suddenly, a formidable voice cried out, Attack! And Prince de Boseno was seen raising his gigantic form to the top of the wall which was covered with barbs and iron spikes. Behind him rushed his companions, and the people followed. Some hammered against the wall to make holes in it. Others endeavored to tear down the spikes and pull out the barbs. These defenses had given way in places, and some of the invaders had stripped the wall and were sitting astride on the top. Prince de Boseno was waving an immense green flag. Suddenly the crowd wavered, and from it came a long cry of terror. The police and the Republican carabiners, issuing out of all of the entrances of the palace, formed themselves into a column beneath the wall, and in a moment it was cleared of its besiegers. After a long moment of suspense the noise of arms was heard, and the police charged the crowd with fixed bayonets. An instant afterwards, and on the deserted square, strewn with hats and walking-sticks, there reigned a sinister silence. 
Twice again the Dracophiles attempted to form. Twice they were repulsed. The rising was conquered, but Prince de Boseno, standing on the wall of the hostile palace, his flag in his hand, still repelled the attack of a whole brigade. He knocked down all who approached him. At last he, too, was thrown down, and fell on an iron spike, to which he remained hooked, still clasping the standard of the Draconides. On the following day the ministers of the Republic and the members of Parliament determined to take energetic measures. In vain this time did President Formose attempt to evade his responsibilities. The government discussed the question of depriving Chatillon of his rank and dignities, and of indicting him before the High Court as a conspirator, an enemy of the public good, a traitor, etc. At this news the Emerald's old companions in arms, who the very evening before had beset him with their adulations, made no effort to conceal their joy. But Chatillon remained popular with the middle classes of Alca, and one still heard the hymn of the liberators sounding in the streets, It is Chatillon we want. The ministers were embarrassed. They intended to indict Chatillon before the high court, but they knew nothing. They remained in that total ignorance reserved for those who govern men. They were incapable of advancing any grave charges against Chatillon. They could supply the prosecution with nothing but the ridiculous lies of their spies. Chatillon's share in the plot, and his relations with Prince Crucho, remained the secret of the thirty thousand Dracophiles. The ministers and the deputies had suspicions and even certainties, but they had no proofs. The public prosecutor said to the Minister of Justice, Very little is needed for a political prosecution, but I have nothing at all, and that is not enough. The affair made no progress. The enemies of the Republic were triumphant. On the 18th of September the news ran in Alca that Chatillon had taken flight. Everywhere there was surprise and astonishment. People doubted, for they could not understand. This is what had happened. One day, as the brave under-emerald Vulcan mold happened, as if by chance to go into the office of M. Babotan, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, he remarked with his usual frankness, M. Babotan, your colleagues do not seem to me to be up to much. It is evident that they have never commanded a ship. That fool Chatillon gives them a deuced bad fit of the shivers. The Minister, in sign of denial, waved his paper knife in the air above his desk. I don't deny it answered Vulcan Mould. You don't know how to get rid of Chatillon. You do not dare to indict him before the High Court, because you are not sure of being able to bring forward a strong enough charge. Bigor will defend him, and Bigor is a clever advocate. You are right, Monsieur Barbertan. You are right. It would be a dangerous trial. Ah, my good friend, said the minister in a careless tone, if you knew how satisfied we are. I receive the most reassuring news from my prefects. The good sense of the penguins will do justice to the intrigues of this mutinous soldier. Can you suppose for a moment that a great people, an intelligent, laborious people, devoted to liberal institutions, which— Vulcanmold interrupted with a great sigh. Ah! If I had time to do it, I would relieve you of your difficulty. I would juggle away my chatillon like a nutmeg out of a thimble— I would fillip him off to Porpoisia. The minister paid close attention. It would not take long, continued the sailor. I would rid you in a trice of the creature. But just now I have other fish to fry. I am in a bad hole. I must find a pretty big sum. But deuce take it. Honour before everything. The minister and under Emeril looked at each other for a moment in silence. Then Barbertan said with authority, under emerald vulcan mould get rid of this seditious soldier you will render a great service to penguinia and the minister of home affairs will see that your gambling debts are paid the same evening vulcan mould called on chatillon and looked at him for some time with an expression of grief and mystery why do you look like that asked the emerald in an uneasy tone vulcan mould said to him sadly old brother in arms all is discovered for the past half-hour the government knows everything." At these words Chatillon sank down overwhelmed. Vulcan Mould continued, "'You may be arrested at any moment. I advise you to make off.' And drawing out his watch, "'Not a minute to lose.' "'Have I time to call on the Viscountess Olive?' "'It would be mad,' said Vulcan Mould, 
handing him a passport and a pair of blue spectacles and telling him to have courage. I will, said Chatillon. Good-bye, old chum. Good-bye, and thanks. You have saved my life. That is the least I could do. A quarter of an hour later the brave Emeril had left the city of Alca. He embarked that night on an old cutter at La Cirque and set sail for Porpoisia. But eight miles from the coast he was captured by a despatch boat, which was sailing without lights and which was under the flag of the Queen of the Black Islands. That queen had for a long time nourished a fatal passion for Chatillon. End of Book Five, Chapter Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa, Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Five, Modern Times, Chatillon. Book Five, Chapter Seven, Conclusion. Nunc est bibendum. Delivered from its fears and pleased at having escaped from so great a danger, the government resolved to celebrate the anniversary of the Penguin regeneration and the establishment of the Republic by holding a general holiday. President Foremost. The ministers and the members of the chamber and of the senate were present at the ceremony. The generalissimo of the penguin army was present in uniform. He was cheered. Preceded by the black flag of misery and the red flag of revolt, deputations of workmen walked in the procession, their aspect one of grim protection. President, ministers, deputies, officials, heads of the magistracy and of the army, each in their own names and in the name of the sovereign people, renewed the ancient oath to live in freedom or to die. It was an alternative upon which they were resolutely determined, but they preferred to live in freedom. There were games, speeches, and songs. After the departure of the representatives of the state, the crowd of citizens separated slowly and peaceably, shouting out, Hurrah for the Republic! Hurrah for Liberty! Down with the shaven pates! The newspapers mentioned only one regrettable incident that happened on that wonderful day. Prince de Boseno was quietly smoking a cigar in the Queen's Meadow when the state procession passed by. The prince approached the minister's carriage and said in a loud voice, Death to the Republicans! He was immediately apprehended by the police, to whom he offered a most desperate resistance. He knocked them down in crowds, but he was conquered by numbers and bruised, scratched, swollen, and unrecognizable even to the eyes of his wife, he was dragged through the joyous streets into an obscure prison. The magistrates carried on the case against Chatillon in a peculiar style. Letters were found at the Admiralty which revealed the complicity of the Reverend Father Agaric in the plot. Immediately public opinion was inflamed against the monks, and Parliament voted, one after the other, a dozen laws which restrained, diminished, limited, prescribed, suppressed, determined, and curtailed their rights, immunities, exemptions, privileges, and benefits, and created many invalidating disqualifications against them. The Reverend Father Agaric steadfastly endured the rigor of the laws which struck him personally, as well as the terrible fall of the emerald of which he was the chief cause. Far from yielding to evil fortune, he regarded it as but a bird of passage. He was planning new political designs more audacious than the first. When his projects were sufficiently ripe, he went one day to the wood of Connells. A thrush sang in a tree, and a little hedgehog crossed the stony path in front of him with awkward steps. Agaric walked with great strides, muttering fragments of sentences to himself. When he reached the door of the laboratory, in which, for so many years, the pious manufacturer had distilled the golden liqueur of St. Orborosia, he found the place deserted and the door shut. Having walked around the building, he saw in the back yard the venerable Cornmuse, who, with his habit pinned up, was climbing a ladder that leaned against the wall. "'Is that you, my dear friend?' said he to him. "'What are you doing there?' "'You can see for yourself.' answered the monk of Connells in a feeble voice, turning a sorrowful look upon Agaric. I am going into my house. The red pupils of his eyes no longer imitated the triumph and brilliance of the ruby. They flashed mournful and troubled glances. His countenance had lost its happy fullness. His shining head was no longer pleasant to the sight. 
Perspiration and inflamed blotches had altered its inestimable perfection. "'I don't understand,' said Agaric. "'It is easy enough to understand. You see the consequences of your plot. Although a multitude of laws are directed against me, I have managed to elude the greater number of them. Some, however, have struck me. These vindictive men have closed my laboratories and my shops, and confiscated my bottles, my stills, and my retorts. They have put seals on my doors, and now I am compelled to go in through the window. I am barely able to extract in secret and from time to time the juice of a few plants, and that with an apparatus which the humblest laborer would despise. "'You suffer from the persecution,' said Agaric. "'It strikes us all.' The monk of Connells passed his hand over his afflicted brow. "'I told you so, Brother Agaric. I told you that your enterprise would turn against ourselves.' "'Our defeat is only momentary,' replied Agaric eagerly. "'It is due to purely accidental causes. It results from mere contingencies. Chatillon was a fool. He has drowned himself in his own ineptitude. Listen to me, Brother Cornmuse. We have not a moment to lose. We must free the Penguin people. We must deliver them from their tyrants, save them from themselves, restore the dragon's crest, re-establish the ancient state, the, the good state, for the honor of religion and the exaltation of the Catholic faith. Chatillon was a bad instrument. He broke in our hands. Let us take a better instrument to replace him. I have the man who will destroy this impious democracy. He is a civil official. His name is Gomoru. The penguins worship him. He has already betrayed his party for a plate of rice. There's the man we want. At the beginning of this speech, the monk of Connells had climbed into his window and pulled up the ladder. I foresee, answered he, with his nose through the sash that you will not stop until you have us all expelled from this pleasant, agreeable, and sweet land of Penguinia. Good night. God keep you. Agaric, standing before the wall, entreated his dearest brother to listen to him for a moment. Understand your own interest better, Cornmuse. Penguinia is ours. What do we need to conquer it? Just one effort more. One more little sacrifice of money and— but without listening further, the monk of Connells drew in his head and closed his window. End of chapter 7 and the end of book 5ois.com Penguin Island by Anatole France Book 6 Modern Times The Affair of the 80,000 Trusses of Hay The book begins with a quote O Father Zeus only save thou the sons of the Achaeans from the darkness and make clear sky and vouchsafe sight to our eyes and then so it be but light slay us since such is thy good pleasure the Iliad 17, 645, and the following. Book 6, Chapter 1. General Greatock, Duke of Skull. A short time after the flight of the Emeril, a middle-class Jew called Pyro, desirous of associating with the aristocracy and wishing to serve his country, entered the Penguin army. The minister of war, who at that time was Greatock, Duke of Skull, could not endure him. He blamed him for his zeal, his hooked nose, his vanity, his fondness for study, his thick lips, and his exemplary conduct. Every time the author of any misdeed was looked for, Greatock used to say, It must be Pyro. One morning, General Panther, the chief of staff, informed Greatock of a serious matter. Eighty thousand trusses of hay intended for the cavalry had disappeared, and not a trace of them was to be found. Greatock exclaimed at once, it must be Pyro who has stolen them. He remained in thought for some time, and said, The more I think of it, the more I am convinced that Pyro has stolen those eighty thousand trusses of hay, and I know it by this. He stole them in order that he might sell them to our bitter enemies, the porpoises. What an infamous piece of treachery! There is no doubt about it, answered Panther. It only remains to prove it. 
The same day, as he passed by a cavalry barracks, Prince de Boseno heard the troopers as they were sweeping out the yard, singing, Boseno et Progrochon, on en va faire des andouilles, des sociés, du jambon, pour le rêve de pauvre it seemed to him, contrary to all discipline, that soldiers should sing this domestic and revolutionary refrain, which on days of riot had been uttered by the lips of jeering workmen. On this occasion he deplored the moral degeneration of the army, and thought with a bitter smile that his old comrade Greathawk, the head of this degenerate army, basely exposed him to the malice of an unpatriotic government, and he promised himself that he would make an improvement before long. That scoundrel Greatock, said he to himself, will not long remain a minister. Prince de Boseno was the most irreconcilable of the opponents of modern democracy, free thought, and the government which the Penguins had voluntarily given themselves. He had a vigorous and undisguised hatred for the Jews, and he worked in public and in private, night and day, for the restoration of the line of the Draconides. His ardent royalism was still further excited by the thought of his private affairs, which were in a bad way, and were hourly growing worse. He had no hope of seeing an end to his pecuniary embarrassments until the heir of Draco the Great entered the city of Alca. When he returned to his house, the prince took out of his safe a bundle of old letters, consisting of a private correspondence of the most secret nature, which he had obtained from a treacherous secretary. They proved that his old comrade Greathawk, the Duke of Skull, had been guilty of jobbery regarding the military stores, and had received a present of no great value from a manufacturer called Mallory. The very smallness of this present deprived the minister who had accepted it of all excuse. The prince re-read the letters with a bitter satisfaction, put them carefully back into his safe, and dashed to the minister of war. He was a man of resolute character. On being told that the minister could see no one, he knocked down the ushers, swept aside the orderlies, trampled underfoot the civil and military clerks, burst through the doors, and entered the room of the astonished Greathawk. I will not say much, said he to him, but I will speak to the point. You are a confounded cad. I have asked you to put a flea in the ear of General Moschin, the tool of those Republicans, and you would not do it. I have asked you to give a command to General de Clapier, who works for the Dracophils, and who has obliged me personally, and you would not do it. I have asked you to dismiss General Tandem, the commander of Port Alca, who robbed me of fifty louis at cards, and who had me handcuffed when I was brought before the High Court as Emerald Chatillon's accomplice. You would not do it. I asked you for the hay and bran stores. You would not give them. I asked you to send me on a secret mission to Porposia. You refused and not satisfied with these repeated refusals, you have designated me to your government colleagues as a dangerous person who ought to be watched. And it is owing to you that I have been shadowed by the police. You old traitor, I ask nothing more from you, and I have but one word to say to you. Clear out. You have bothered us too long. Besides, we will force the vile republic to replace you by one of your own party. You know that I am a man of my word. If in twenty-four hours you have not handed in your resignation, I will publish the Mallory dossier in the newspapers. But Greatock calmly and serenely replied, Be quiet, you fool. I am just having a Jew transported. I am handing over Pyro to justice as guilty of having stolen eighty thousand trusses of hay. Prince Boseno, whose anger vanished like a dream, smiled. I is that, is that true? You will see. My congratulations, Great Hawk. But as one always needs to take precautions with you, I shall immediately publish the good news. People will read this evening about Pyro's arrest in every newspaper in Alca. And he went away muttering, That Pyro, I suspected he would come to a bad end. A moment later, General Panther appeared before Great Hawk. Sir, said he, I have just examined the business of the eighty thousand trusses of hay. There is no evidence against Pyro. Let it be found, answered Greatock. Justice requires it. Have Pyro arrested at once. End of Book Six, Chapter One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirois. 
michael.sirois.com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Six, Modern Times. Book Six, Chapter Two, Pyro. All Penguinia heard with horror of Pyro's crime. At the same time, there was a sort of satisfaction that this embezzlement, combined with treachery and even bordering on sacrilege, had been committed by a Jew. In order to understand this feeling, it is necessary to be acquainted with the state of public opinion regarding the Jews, both great and small. As we have had occasion to say in this history, the universally detested and all-powerful financial caste was composed of Christians and of Jews. The Jews who formed part of it, and on whom the people poured all their hatred, were the upper-class Jews. They possessed immense riches, and it was said held more than a fifth part of the total property of Penguinia. Outside this formidable caste there was a multitude of Jews of a mediocre condition, who were not more loved than the others, and who were feared much less. In every ordered state wealth is a sacred thing. In democracies it is the only sacred thing. Now the Penguin State was democratic. Three or four financial companies exercised a more extensive, and above all more effective and continuous power, than that of the ministers of the Republic. The latter were puppets whom the companies ruled in secret, whom they compelled by intimidation or corruption to favor themselves at the expense of the State, and whom they ruined by calumnies in the press if they remained honest. In spite of the secrecy of the Exchequer, Enough appeared to make the country indignant, but the middle-class penguins had, from the greatest to the least of them, been brought up to hold money in great reverence, and as they all had property, either much or little, they were strongly impressed with the solidarity of capital, and understood that a small fortune is not safe, unless a big one is protected. For these reasons they conceived a religious respect for the Jews' millions, and self-interest being stronger with them than aversion, they were as much afraid as they were of death to touch a single hair of one of the rich Jews whom they detested. Towards the poorer Jews they felt less ceremonious, and when they saw any of them down they trampled on them. That is why the entire nation learnt with thorough satisfaction that the traitor was a Jew. They could take vengeance on all Israel in his person without any fear of compromising the public credit. That Pyro had stolen the eighty thousand trusses of hay, nobody hesitated for a moment to believe. No one doubted, because the general ignorance, in which everybody was, concerning the affair, did not allow of doubt, for doubt is a thing that demands motives. People do not doubt without reasons, in the same way that people believe without reasons. The thing was not doubted because it was repeated everywhere, and with the public to repeat is to prove. It was not doubted because people wished to believe Pyro guilty, and one believes what one wishes to believe. Finally, it was not doubted because the faculty of doubt is rare amongst men. Very few minds carry in them its germs, and these are not developed without cultivation. Doubt is singular, exquisite, philosophic, immoral, transcendent, monstrous, full of malignity, injurious to persons and to property, contrary to the good order of governments and to the prosperity of empires, fatal to humanity, destructive of the gods, held in horror by heaven and earth. The mass of the penguins were ignorant of doubt. It believed in Pyro's guilt, and this conviction immediately became one of its chief national beliefs and an essential truth in its patriotic creed. Pyro was tried secretly and condemned. General Panther immediately went to the Minister of War to tell him the result. Luckily, said he, the judges were certain, for they had no proofs. Proofs, muttered Greatalk. Proofs, what do they prove? There is only one certain irrefragable proof, the confession of the guilty person. Has Pyro confessed? No, General. He will confess. He ought to. Panther, we must induce him. Tell him it is to his interest. Promise him that if he confesses, he will obtain favors, a reduction of his sentence. Full pardon. Promise him that if he confesses, his innocence will be admitted, that he will be decorated. Appeal to his good feelings. Let him confess from patriotism, for the flag, for the sake of order, from respect for the hierarchy, at the special command of the Minister of War militarily. But tell me, Panther, has he not confessed already? 
There are tacit confessions. Silence is a confession. But, General, he is not silent. He keeps on squealing like a pig that he is innocent. Panther, the confessions of a guilty man, sometimes result from the vehemence of his denials. To deny desperately is to confess. Pyro has confessed. We must have witnesses of his confessions. Justice requires them. There was in western Penguinia a seaport called La Cirque, formed of three small bays, and formerly greatly frequented by ships, but now solitary and deserted. Gloomy lagoons stretched along its low coasts, exhaling a pestilent odor, while fever hovered over its sleepy waters. Here, on the borders of the sea, there was built a high square tower, like the old Campanile at Venice, from the side of which, close to the summit, hung an open cage, which was fastened by a chain to a transverse beam. In the times of the Draconides, the inquisitors of Alca used to put heretical clergy into this cage. It had been empty for three hundred years, but now Pyro was imprisoned in it under the guard of sixty warders who lived in the tower and did not lose sight of him night or day, spying on him for confessions that they might afterwards report to the minister of war. For Greatock, careful and prudent, desired confessions and still further confessions. Greatock, who was looked upon as a fool, was in reality a man of great ability and full of rare foresight. In the meantime, Pyrot, burned by the sun, eaten by mosquitoes, soaked in the rain, hail, and snow, frozen by the cold, tossed about terribly by the wind, beset by the sinister croaking of the ravens that perched upon his cage, kept writing down his innocence on pieces torn off his shirt, with a toothpick dipped in blood. These rags were lost in the sea, or fell into the hands of the jailers. But Pyro's protests moved nobody, because his confessions had been published. End of Book Six, Chapter Two